Today we are, um, are we good, Luke? We're good. We're good. Uh, we're, we're also running tech as well as uh, claiming to be not experts on the topic here today. We wanted to take a look at egg, the theme of exile. The theme of exile is very prominent in scripture from beginning to end. And uh, in, in Isaiah 5.13, it says, Therefore my people go into exile for a lack of knowledge. Their honored men go hungry, and their multitude is parched with thirst. Therefore, as Sheol has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure, and the nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude will go down, her revelers and he who exalts in her, man is humbled, and each one is brought low, and the eyes of the haughty are brought low. And throughout scripture, this is what happens. There is this theme of exile for a lack of knowledge, and people are brought low. Uh, we we want to try and cover off a fair bit today. So, Luke, let me start with you. When we think of this theme of exile, what is it? Let's define the term, first of all. Yeah. So exile, as you've already mentioned, is a, a very broad theme in Scripture. That We could see it really from the very beginnings of the Old Testament all the way through into the New Testament, although it takes various forms. I think for most of us, when we hear the word exile, when we think of exile, we think of the exile of Israel from their land. When, when they were taken over by Babylon and Assyria, the, the exile of being, being cast out from the promised land as a result of covenant disobedience, as a result of God's people breaking the covenant that they had made with him. And so that is sort of the exile as kind of a, a historical event, although there is the theme of exile before that and the theme of exile afterwards. The, the removing of God's people from the land uh, as, a, as a form of, of discipline, really, and punishment for covenant unfaithfulness is probably the, the place you would first go to define exile before you sort of have it branch out from there. Sure. Gary, maybe let's expand on that because, Luke, you've done a great job in terms of defining what exile is. In terms of uh, the Bible, let's, let's start to parse that out maybe a little bit more from beginning to end. Uh, where do we see these themes and how do we understand it? Well, maybe most importantly, we see it, or firstly, we see it in the garden. Yeah. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve are exiled, as it were, from from that which defined really the presence of God. We spoke last week about the garden really being a proto-temple, the first yeah. temple, the place where God, not only the place where God dwelt, but the place, a meeting place with God. And so exile becomes this consequence, as, as Luke's rightly pointed out, of covenantal unfaithfulness. There are covenants that are... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for that are uh, conditional? Sometimes God makes conditional promises to his people, and when they break those promises, mm -hmm. there are consequences. And, and then there are questions that arise, of course, within Israel of, of God's half of the equation. They, they conveniently forget their unfaithfulness, and they say, where is God? Where, when is God not sovereign? Uh, why do we not have our land? Why do we, uh, why do we not have our temple? Why, can, why are we not free to worship? Um, and and these become significant theological questions mm -hmm. for ancient Israel to ponder. Uh, and then, in a way, in the New Testament, we're also spoken of as exiles. Yeah. Peter writes a letter and. And uses a, a coupling, a very, very interesting coupling. So in the New Testament, it has a different perspective because we're, of course, after the cross, um, which is giving away the game in a way, giving away the 20th minute of our table talk. But, but after the cross, then, uh, Peter refers to us as elect exiles. And so this interesting juxtaposition of a chosen people and yet a people that are exiled in a way from their homeland are are. Our true nationality, if it, as, you, as it were, our true homeland is not actually earth. <laughs> yeah. Not actually, we're not Canadian first and foremost. We are Christians. And because of that then, right now we are in a way living in exile, yeah. even though we have such great and precious promises of, of the Lord and his presence. Yeah. Uh, 
because of Christ. Yeah, and so we can hear Paul in Philippians 3. He talks about how we're citizens of heaven. Mm -hmm. And so because we're citizens of another realm, we currently live in this realm, and therefore we are exiles. Luke, you've talked a bit about uh, covenantal unfaithfulness, mm -hmm. and we, we wanted to talk a little bit about what's gone wrong. Well, what's gone wrong is covenantal unfaithfulness. So to the average person who's listening today, covenantal unfaithfulness is a, wow, it's like Charlie Brown's adults, you know, in the classroom, wah, 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 wah. Right. What is covenantal unfaithfulness? What does that mean? Yeah, there, there were many, many covenants that God made with his people all throughout the Old Testament. When we think of exile, specifically as we relate it to God's people being expelled from their land, we're thinking of the, the covenant that God made with his people at Mount Sinai when he gave them the, the Ten Commandments, but then also then it's not just the Ten Commandments, it was a, a fairly extensive law that he gave to his people. And he, he laid out for them very clearly uh, in, in Exodus, and then again in the book of Deuteronomy, all of the blessings that would come to them if they kept the covenant mm -hmm. and all of the punishments that would come for disobedience. And all the way back in Exodus, God told them, if you disobey the words of this covenant, you will be exiled. You will be taken away. Your enemies will overtake you. So it was really specified mm -hmm. from the very start of the covenant. It was spelled out so that it wouldn't have been a surprise for God's people. This is this is what will happen when you break the covenant. And Israel, as you read all through the Old Testament, you know, especially into books like Judges and into you know, First and Second mm -hmm. Kings, for example, you see all of the many ways that Israel broke that covenant that was given to them. And pretty much in all of the ways, really. I can't think of any ways that they did not break pretty much all of God's covenant there at Mount Sinai when they had been rescued from Egypt and when he made them really his his people as one nation yeah covenantal unfaithfulness it doesn't it it begins in the garden if you yeah. if you think god had given his law to adam you may eat of any tree in the garden except you may not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and on the day that you eat of it you will surely die and so there is covenantal blessing you can eat of any tree in the garden but on the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the covenantal curse is you will die. And we often hear those words and think, but they didn't die. But there was this spiritual death that immediately occurred and then death, death followed. And so death reigned, as Paul can say, it reigned from, from Adam onwards. And so we, we know that uh, this impact of uh, covenantal unfaithfulness, most simply put, it's it's being disobedient to the commands of God. It might be helpful, like just to enumerate some of those ways. Uh, completely side with Luke, it, it's hard to say in which way they weren't uh, covenantally unfaithful, but you know we can see it. We're going through First Kings on yep. Sunday now. We see it in the life of Solomon, writ large. Uh, you could say uh, it, it was perverted worship, uh, there was misplaced faith and trust, they placed their trust in the wrong things, sometimes yeah. that was yeah. political alliances, uh, you're going to be handling chapters 11 and 12, really it starts in 3 verse 1 where he picks yeah. a wife uh, from Pharaoh, um, Pharaoh's daughter, and he calls her a princess, already the Bible's hinting at, well yes, this is a strategic alliance that he's making. And that meant he wasn't trusting in the Lord. You can see that in the first you read from Isaiah 5. The early chapters of Isaiah yep. are rife with that, where the, the trust of the nation is in these political alliances rather than in the Lord. So it was their worship. It was their faith. It was, um, you know, the worship of uh, idolatrous worship, um, altars and practices yep. that were not uh, godly. We see that again in, in Solomon's life. And so... These are just the fundamental areas of life and practice, all of them tainted uh, by sin. Yeah, and we've been learning the verse, uh, Luke, you've been having us learn 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Mm. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will um, hear from heaven and I will uh, forgive their sin and I will heal, heal their land. And I might have got the order a little bit mixed up, but... Um, 
But there was this sense that covenantal curses mm. uh, resulted in the land being disrupted. And we might think, oh, you know, how is that even true for our day? What happens when there's dishonesty and there's unjust mm -hmm. scales yes. and people cheat one another? Mm -hmm. um, it, it results in, in economic ruin. It results in ecological ruin. Uh, it's not just something that happened in the Old Testament. It's something right. that the law of God has this bearing out. Now, the law of God is a whole other topic that we could talk about. Right. But the, the basic idea that when we are unfaithful to God, and that is in all realms, even the common grace elements, when we are unfaithful and not truthful and not practicing justice, everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. So what, Gary, is God doing yeah. when, in light of all these things? Like, it looks like humanity just keeps sliding down this slope. So what on earth is God doing? Because it could look like God's out of control. Yeah, we actually, though, I would, I would argue we're seeing God's faithfulness in two different ways. One, he is faithful to judge. Yep. So he's faithful to judge sin and wickedness, um, and, but he's also faithful to his promises. So both of them, I mean, in, in a way, the judgment is coming out of his promises. Luke, you alluded to that, you know, the end yep. of Deuteronomy, the four chapters that cover that. Um, so, so God is still on the throne. He's, he is faithful, and he's faithfully working out his will, even through these ways and, and means that look so contrary to godliness. Um, and so he allows, we, again, you know, you're going to be in 1 Kings 11. So we yeah. see language like uh, raising up of adversaries. Yeah. You know, you could look at that as just a political problem. There is, you know, Solomon has his unjust, uh, you know, poorly thought through policies. His son is kind of got this edginess to him. It's like he has to be his own man and he listens to the wrong counsel. Um, so there are different things going on that are very human. Mm -hmm. There's the rise of Jeroboam again. You've got this rival and, and, and we've got tribalism in our own country, don't we? And so maybe it's not so unusual to see it in ancient Israel as well. That's all the human side, but then you get that language of God raising up these adversaries. Yep. So, so even the very adversarial aspects against Israel are under God's hand. And he's weaving out his history in a way that ultimately does bring glory. It will ultimately point to the cross. It ultimately points to God's glory in every way. Mm -hmm. and, and man is never going to have his way as many decisions as we make, all those the exercise of our moral agency that we do every single day, all of it is subject ultimately to God's uh, glory. Yeah, we could think of how God is working out all things for his glory, um, as Hebrews 12 talks about, um, that the Lord disciplines those he loves, and exile is a form of the Lord's sovereign yeah, discipline. Yeah, it is. And, and in recognizing that, it, it's not... It's not a punitive discipline. It's right. not as though uh, God is is punishing because he's against you. It is a refining discipline that is calling yeah. you back. That's And so this is why we talk Thanks about... Thanks for mentioning that because I, I, yeah. even as I was talking, I wanted to use that word sanctifying. It, it yeah. really is a sanctifying work. And of course, ultimately, the people are called back. Yeah. Uh, not the northern tribes. We never hear from them again, interestingly. That's a separate topic maybe for another day. But, but Judah itself, through which yep. the promise will come, yep. those people do get called back. So it is very much a restorative hand of God. It's not just punitive. It, there is consequence, but there's also hope and restoration. And, and this, this ought to be an encouragement to us, even in terms of church discipline. And yeah. when we think about mm. church discipline, people often have a very negative view, like, it's casting people out of the church. And yet, church discipline happens every time we are seeking to resolve a dispute between a brother or a sister. When we are coming back together, it's, it's yeah. resolving this issue of exile that exists. It's, it's restoring that which is broken. Mm. So we need to come, Luke, to the most basic of questions then that kind of puts the pretty bow on this whole discussion. If exile is being driven away from God and out of his presence and discipline for uh, a, a failure to be obedient, 
the the real question we have to answer is what's the way back yeah for sure we've talked about exile as a as a form of discipline as a, a form of sanctification and i think part of that sanctification is that exile is meant to foster and breed humility in mm -hmm. in god's people that was a huge part of why they were sent into exile and i think i mean there were many purposes and reasons for the law as we've said there's a whole other conversation to be had about that but the law showed god's people and the exile showed god's people just how unable they were to be obedient to god to reach his standards and it was designed in part to to humble them to show them that really the way back is not at all achievable in human strength or by human effort it is mm -hmm absolutely needed that God would provide the way back for his people. And all of the covenants, all of the experiences of, of exile all throughout the Old Testament were all leading and pointing towards God's ultimate plan of redemption in Jesus. And Jesus mm -hmm. is the way back not only for God's people Israel, but for all the nations of the world. It expands out, yeah. not just to Israel, but then all across the globe, all across the world, every tribe and nation and people and tongue. And so the, the way back really is the way that God provides for people in Christ. Yeah, and so we've, we've got this way back, Gary. So if we, were to, if we were to just put it in its most basic terms, someone who's watching, they're thinking, what does exile have to do with me? I yeah. understand the problem of being away from God. What's the way back? Yeah, and I think that that's just one, that's a great way of summarizing what exile is. It's, it's being outside of, of the presence of God. Um, I was just chatting with someone who is feeling that sense of separation from God based on things they've felt and thought and done. And that's a very real feeling. That's, that is really the fundamental existential crisis and most people deny it, they shove it down, they, they put a lid on it, they, they uh, try to subvert that feeling of separation from God by accomplishing various things in life, and that's either through relationships or through the talents that God, the God you deny, has actually given you, could be education, work, whatever. And, and none of those things ultimately satisfy. You quoted from Augustine last Sunday, and mm -hmm. you know we are going to be restless until we find our rest in him and and that restlessness is because you were you know truly made in god's image and so as you alluded to paul you know talking about being citizens of heaven you're going to be restless until you find where your true citizenship lay and that's your true identity you know everyone wants to find themselves what is your true identity your true identity is going to be found in christ and that's when you you see the great reconciliation that uh, which is afar off is brought near, um, and so that those feelings that you have, I'm going to say they're very real. I'm not going to try to placate you by saying ignore them. Uh, that's what the world does. As a Christian pastor, I'm going to I'm going to demand that you come face to face with the living God and 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 get reconciled to God. And that is is not by your own efforts. There's no no way that you can think properly, uh, feel properly or do anything properly to make yourself right before God. As, as you already said, Luke, it's, it's not by our own efforts. It's outside of ourselves. We need somebody to act as that mediator, and that is Jesus Christ. And, and then so we base uh, our reconciliation with God, not on our own performance, but on the performance of Christ on our behalf. He, he loved us and gave himself for us, as Paul says to the Galatians. So even Christ himself, who humbles himself, he leaves his father's throne. He comes into the world full of people who are in exile mm -hmm. so that he might take us out and take us out of exile and bring us to God. One mm -hmm. of the great uh, analogies and allegories that have been written on the picture of, of the journey in exile, moving from exile to the promised land, Mm. is John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. Mm. And that not only displays the, uh, the journey of Christian, the main character in his movement towards the celestial city, but it also pictures how we move 
not instantaneously out of exile, but we're on a journey. And that journey is the journey that first sets us on the road of salvation that leads us to the celestial city. And it is a journey. And so we don't expect God to bang, take us out of exile and everything's fixed. We expect that this is a long, arduous journey where he is working in us to prepare us for the city where we will delight in him. That's a lot to take in today. And yeah. as always, if you've got questions, you can drop any one of us an email. We're always glad to talk about the implications of these things and the further biblical questions that these raise. We always hope to see you on Sunday. We love worshiping together and mm -hmm. we've got our nine and 11 o'clock services on Sunday morning. You are always welcome. Uh, you can preview how to screen on our website, cbcolderton.ca. And uh, Luke and Gary, thanks uh, as always. And until next week, we'll uh, be here on Table Talk and we'll be here on uh, Sunday morning. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.